Hi guys, I'm Marie and I'm Maddie and we are here recording episode two, part two of Robert Garrow. Yes. So welcome for some more disturbing content. Also, sorry for any noises you hear in the background of this one. The cat did the come cat into the The cat is so the, annoying. He sat out and meowed the whole time we were I had to like hit Madison half. like five times to stop her I from going and letting let the cat back. in. He was in the garage. Uh. And then he just wanted to come in here, and then he was so yeah. happy. Okay, guys, we have our merch contest going on right now on our Patreon. Go and check it out. We are giving away one merch item. Every week of this month. Every week of this month. So we are doing a drawing once on a our week Patreon. on our Patreon for a free merch item for the month of June. Yes, so if you want to be involved in that, go ahead and join Patreon now. The link is in our Instagram bio. Also, probably in the description of this episode. It is, yes. So, come and visit us on Patreon. We have a ton of episodes. You can also hop over and just buy our merchandise as well. Or you can draw, yep. get in the drawing for free merchandise. Either way, there's a link for both of them in our bio and on this episode. Yep. Let's get into this episode. So, if you haven't listened to episode one of Robert Garrow, go back and listen to that now. Because otherwise, it's going to seem a little abrupt. The start of this episode, but I will recap just a little bit where we left off, and that was with Robert Garrow leading the four campers into the woods, because remember, he wants to siphon gas from them, and he wants to tie them to a tree so that they can't tell on him, and he has time to get away. Madison had a severe meltdown because they were allowing him to take them into the woods, and that's where we left off. As he leads them down the trail, Phil was the first to break the silence, and he says, I'd be happy to give you gas. Garrow tells them just to keep walking. And Phil says, listen, we've been in trouble before, and we won't tell on you. Just take the gas and, like, basically leave us alone. Garrow says to be quiet and keep walking. And then he said, don't try anything or I will blow a hole in you. I've killed before and I'll kill again. After about 100 feet, he directed them off the road to the right on the opposite side of the road of their campsite. Now, if you remember, Daniel was found on the opposite side of the road in the trees. They saw an orange compact car parked in the clearing nearby. Now, if you remember, Garrow drives Mm -hmm. an orangish-reddish Volkswagen So he first forced Phil to sit with his back to the tree, and then he ordered Dave to tie him with a length of rope that he pulled from his back pocket. Fuck no. Fuck, fuck, fuck no. Run. He then made Dave tie Nick in the same manner. He then marched Dave and Carol to another area just a little further away, and as he did, he told Phil and Nick that they'd better stay that way or they would be sorry. He then instructed Carol to tie Dave to a tree, but her hands were shaking so bad that she was struggling, and she looked up at him. He yelled at her to stop looking at him. She was eventually able to tie him, and then Garrow took Carol and walked back over to check on Nick and Phil, who were still securely tied to the trees. He then took her to another tree, where he had formerly placed a rain jacket on the ground, and he had her sit. And as he tied her, he said, I'm sorry about your sandals which were covered in mud. He then said, I'll be right back. I'm going to take you with me, and then I'll probably let you go. No. No. The way the group was tied, they could not see each other, but they could hear Garrow leave to go siphon gas. But Carol then heard him talking to Phil, and she heard something like a gargling sound. And... They described it as it sounded almost like Phil was throwing up. And this sound was actually Garrow poking Phil lightly with his knife, leaving four bruises and light punctures. And then he would slowly insert the knife into his chest, puncturing a lung, which is what made the gargling sound. And you guys, 
They can't see this. They can only hear it. Why is Karen, going to the woods with him? What is wrong with them? Karen actually yells, what are you doing? And he told her that everything was okay and that he would be done in a minute. While this was happening, Nicholas and Dave began to struggle against the ropes and they actually managed to free themselves. Nick runs into the woods and Dave runs towards the trees that Carol is tied to. But Garrow actually intercepts him and he puts up his hands and pleads for Garrow not to hurt him. He checks Carol's ropes to make sure that they are secure and he tells Dave that he needs to help him find Nick. So now we have one person tied to a tree who we know has been stabbed, but the rest don't know that. Carol is still tied to a tree. Nick has run off and he has Dave trying to help him find Nick. Super smart. Dave assured Garrow that Nick would be hiding nearby and searches around calling his name. But Dave actually knows better. He knows that Nick went for help and he figured that he needs to stall Garrow as long as he can. Carol continues asking Nick if he is okay, but she gets no response from him. Carol is finally able to free herself and she runs to Phil whose shirt is soaked in blood and his lifeless eyes are staring back at her. At this point, she bolts into the woods. And here I kind of imagine like a a scene out of a horror movie where she's like running through the woods, like checking behind her to see if she's being followed. When she reaches the road, she actually encounters a car approaching and she flags it down. She tells the driver that a man is chasing her and that if he catches her, he's going to kill her. He tells her to get in the car. Now he has his cousin in the passenger seat and he has two young boys in the back. And she probably just looks like a scene out of a horror movie. She's covered in scratches from running through the woods. She's panicked, obviously. And she says to them, he didn't even scream when the man stabbed him. So they decide, let's get the hell out of here. Like, this is more than just somebody chasing her through the woods. Like, this is like a psychopath with a knife, right? Meanwhile, Nick had made it back to their campsite, and he jumps in his car, taking off and driving to a nearby restaurant. So now... Dave is the only one left with this fucking killer trying to find Nick, who's now gone. Carol is gone. My gosh. He tells them at the restaurant that a maniac is trying to kill him and his friends in the woods. And they just figure that he's on drugs. They were unable to reach the sheriff that early on a Sunday, but they eventually got in touch with the state police, who eventually showed up. And they make their way back to the campsite. They also picked up some locals on the way. Like just some locals with like their guns and stuff. They're just like stopping and picking people up with guns. One of the men see a patch of grass trampled across the road. And walking towards it, he sees two men lying in a ditch. And he pretends not to see them. He goes back to the group and told them what he had seen. So they get to the campsite and they're kind of like fanning out and looking. And one of the men sees two men laying in a ditch. But he acts like he doesn't see them and he goes back to tell the group what he saw. Suddenly, a man jumps out of the ditch and runs towards the car, diving behind one, screaming that the other man had a gun. So this is David. (laughs) David's like, I'm not going to hide in the ditch with the man with the gun. Like, I'm going to get up and run towards these people. As the group looked in the direction of the ditch, they see Garrow calmly get up with his gun and walk into the woods. Meanwhile, Carol is relating her story to the sheriff, and he thought it was just a crazy story, and he is very skeptical. So nobody's believing her either. This is probably just something that's so far-fetched in this small town that they never assumed this could happen. Meanwhile, a woman is driving down an old dirt strip called Fly Creek Road. She is on her way to meet up with friends who had a campsite set up down this road. She is surprised to see an orange Volkswagen coming towards her because this is a very deserted road. And the driver is wearing dark glasses and a fedora. And he actually waves at her and she felt like he wanted her to pull over. But she didn't recognize him so she assumed that he had mistaken her for someone else. And she keeps driving. As she comes around the corner, she sees a blue car blocking the exit and immediately slams on her brakes and throws the car into reverse, 
honking as she backs up because she thinks this is some sort of trap. And she thinks that the guy in the Volkswagen might have been trying to warn her about it. She loses control of the car and she ends up in the ditch. She jumps out of the car and took off running back the direction she had come. Smart. That's the way the orange car went. This girl gets really lucky, though. Turns out the roadblock was trying to catch the murderer, and they were able to locate the woman unharmed. But she had definitely abandoned her car. (laughs) Jesus. At 1.15... Garrow's car comes towards one of the roadblocks and actually takes off, like through the roadblock. And police pursue the car. And as it turned down a dead end road, they thought, we've got him. But when they come across the car, Garrow is gone. He had abandoned the car. Jesus. I know. So the campers were able to positively identify Garrow by his mugshot, and the manhunt begins for Garrow, spanning from July 29th to August 9th. And wouldn't you know it that Garrow had woodsman skills and survival skills, and when campers in the area began to flee once news reported of Garrow's crimes in the area, a lot of them left their campsites behind, including coolers with food, supplies, so giving Garrow food while in hiding. Yeah. Kind of an unintentional, like, consequence of trying to clear this area, right? Like, they do go through and try to clear as many campers as they can. And half of them are like, peace out. Like, they take off. They leave their shit. They don't care. The other half are like, we're not leaving. Like, we have weapons. We can protect ourselves. Like, we're not worried about it. So half of them are staying put and the other half are abandoning their supplies. Now, another strange thing about Caro's description is that he actually has a heart-shaped tattoo with mom and dad written on it, which I think is very strange. Hmm. The Adirondack Mountains are in northern upstate New York, and they cover about 5,000 square miles. They are roughly a circular dome, about 160 miles in diameter and about one mile high. There are more than 200 lakes around the mountain, including Lake Tier of the Clouds, which is the source of the Hudson River. Okay. So this is a dense forested area. His first week in the Anirondacks, he would break into local hunting camps, stealing food and clothes and, of course, eat all the food that was left behind. He even found a wig. Where did he find a wig? (laughs) I think he found it in like one of the hunting cabins for some reason. I don't even know, dude. And a transistor radio at one. And he covered his face with mud to avoid mosquito bites. His abandoned car would be found on Robs Creek Road. And in the glove box, they found a relatively new map of the area. Yeah. Now... In a compartment in the rear well of the car, a plastic bag was found and inside was another map. And this one was worn and appeared to have been hung on a wall at some point. Now, the map is of New York State and surrounding areas with the dates of 1966 through 1967 on it. There were a ton of pencil notations on the map and there was a route in pencil that went right by the Porter murder scene they also found his eyeglasses in the car and Garrow had pretty bad eyesight without them so they're thinking that his vision might be impaired while he's out on the run maybe why would he leave without his glasses well he was in a hurry he was being chased by the police when he abandoned his car yeah why is he driving without them is probably a better question. Yeah. But remember, he takes off from the scene, surrounded by people, runs to his car. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. So he would actually travel parallel to the roads in order to avoid being spotted. And the search put everyone on edge and false sightings started to pop up everywhere. Police put up roadblocks and helicopters actually broadcast messages from his wife and son to turn himself in. And his wife says, Honey, this is Edith. Won't you please come out? Leave your rifle in the woods. I am here with the state police. They do not want to hurt you. 
and they do not want you to hurt anyone else. The children and I want you to come out. Please listen to me and do what I ask. And his son, Robert Jr., would say, Dad, this is Robert. I'm here with Mom. Won't you please listen to us and come out in the open? We don't want you to get hurt. Please come out. I actually think that's kind of smart if he actually gave a shit, which I doubt that he does. No. So a group of volunteers showed up at a checkpoint and they had a coffin in the back of their truck. (laughs) Yeah. And it was full of beer and ice and they said the beer was for volunteers and the coffin was for Garo. This is like a small town for you right here. This is something that I could see happening. Like I used to live in Montana and uh-huh. I could see this happening there. Like someone pulls open the coffin. And- yeah. They're like, hey, we brought the coffin for when we find Garrow. And by the way, there's beer inside for everybody. Like, yeah, for That's sure. Actually pretty good. So Garrow had found an old hunting building that was stocked with a stove, lots of canned food and cleanish clothes. Yeah. So like they weren't necessarily clean, but like probably cleaner than what he had. What he had on. And I read that he actually, like, to get into this cabin, he actually climbed in through, like, he stood on a table and, like, climbed in through a window so that he didn't have to break any doors or locks so that it would still look like... Abandoned. Abandoned, yeah. Well, and they're not even abandoned. People use them when they're hunting and stuff. Yeah, there's just nobody there right now. Right. After hanging out there for a bit, he left the hut, and about a mile from the camp, he found the Deerfoot Lodge, which was a Christian boys' camp. And in the lot was a white Pontiac. It had a sticker saying, Jesus is peace. And the doors were unlocked. And the keys were in the ignition. Oh, good. Another small town issue here. He took the car. Shocking. He encountered a roadblock at 6.30 a.m. And there, the two police officers drinking coffee and eating breakfast, he sped past the roadblock and a chase ensued. Right. Robert now has that wig on that he found. Yeah. And he has glasses on that he found in the car. Yeah. So the police actually don't think it's Garrow, but they're still chasing him because he blew past the roadblock. Yeah. But they even say on the radio, like, it's not the suspect, but we are in pursuit of a car that blew past the roadblock. It's your suspect, dog. They don't know that, though. I know, but, like, who else would blow past the... Who's blown past the roadblock? 6.30 in the morning, it could be somebody that's still drunk from the night before. I mean, who the fuck knows? Now, they do call for help, but they report the car as being blue, not white. They were busy eating their breakfast and drinking coffee, okay, you guys? At 3.30 p.m., the white car that Garrow was actually driving is reported missing from the boys' Mm -hmm. school. Also around this time, Phil's mom receives a phone call from a male caller saying, I am sorry for what I did. But he got in my way. And it's never confirmed if this was Garrow or not calling her. Can you imagine? No. Garrow stopped at Whispering Pines gas station in Johnsonburg, where the only attendant on duty was busy with customers. And she told him through the window that he would have to pump his own gas, to which he replied that he didn't know how. So I'm assuming that during this time in this place is when you weren't allowed to pump your own gas. But she told him through the window, like, you're going to have to pump your own gas because I'm busy. The state right next to us actually had that law for a long time where you couldn't pump your own gas. It had to be like a licensed person. Mm -hmm. And it always like freaked me out when I would pull up and somebody would like start pumping my gas. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? I, on multiple different occasions, had to help someone from... Oregon pump their gas like here yeah yeah because they were up here and they're like because we like you know those stupid pumps where you have to like push up the thing that holds the pump in place like you don't see them very often the older ones where you have to like take the pump out and then you need to push push it up and then select your fuel grade and all of that thing and people don't yeah. He was trying to figure it out, and yeah. this man is just standing there at the pump, like because he's not never, under. He's probably never pumped. Yeah, gas he has an Oregon life. license yeah. plate. I'm like, do you need help? And he was like, I know I'm from Oregon. I don't pump my own gas. Yeah, but what is? Yeah, I need help. Yeah, and I think they've actually changed that since. Yeah, then you now, pump your own yeah. gas. So he would pump his own gas, but he actually didn't know how to do this. So she had to shout instructions to him out the window <laughs> while he's pumping his gas. That's funny. She went out when she was done with her customer and getting closer to the man, she started to think that it might be Garrow. And when he left, she got the license plate and called police. And this matched the car that had been reported stolen. Perfect. 
he seemed to be heading towards Mineville, where his parents and sister lived. Uh oh. They put police on both houses. And around 10.30, police received a call from a man who said that he had seen Garrow driving the white car. Now, the police that are stationed at his sister's house were the closest to the eyewitness account, and they decided to go and see if they could find the car. At 11 p.m., Robert Garrow knocks on his sister's back door, and this is while the police are looking for his car elsewhere, Based on the eyewitness report. God, no. Nope. I heard, we heard Mystic when we were downstairs. We heard him, like, kicking his ear or something. And he, like, was tapping against, like, the kitchen cabinet or something like that. Like, it sounded pretty loud downstairs. And he literally was like, someone's knocking on a window, right? Someone's knocking on the back door right now. I'm going to turn my head and there's going to be someone right there at the glass back door. <laughs> and that was, that was terrifying. Now, Garrow tells his sister and her husband that he is being framed for marijuana use and that the murder was made up. And his sister claimed that she believed him. When the news came on and Garrow heard the report of his escape and the description of the car, he said that he had to go. And he asked his sister to call his wife and have her send his eyeglasses to her so that he could come back in a couple days for them. So he has an extra set of eyeglasses at home that he's asking his sister, hey, call my wife and have her send the glasses to you so that I can pick them up in a couple days. Because he can't see shit right now. At 11.45, she does call his wife and she discreetly asks for his glasses to be sent to her. And what she doesn't know at this point is that her phone is actually tapped. The next day, which is August 7th, a reporter sees his sister's teenage son leaving the house and they approach him to ask him for a statement about his uncle. And he told them that his uncle had been in their house the night before. Nice. And to their credit, they do call and notify the police about this before going public with the information. Jesus Christ. Just rat out your mom for being an accomplice right there. I know, right? Authorities listen to the tape after hearing this. And they're like, yeah, that's probably true because she does call his wife right after that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I wonder if they would have even listened to the tape if the son hadn't said that because they thought the house was being pretty well watched. So funny. There were multiple break-ins near where Garrow's sister lived. That's weird. And police brought... (laughs) I think not. I think not. And police brought in canines who alerted to Garrow's scent at all of the locations, and they were able to follow it into some nearby woods. But then they would kind of lose the scent. But they do post police there. Okay, at like his entrance point, his exit point? Of the right, woods. like kind of near the woods. And they are surprised when Garrow's nephew appears with a brown paper sack. And this is in the wooded area near where the dogs have followed his scent to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's meeting him to bring him his glasses, isn't he? No, not yet. They ask him what is in the bag. And he said that it's his lunch. And inside the bag are two containers of canned meat and a bottle of soda. Oh, yummy. Yummy lunch there, buddy. Now, on August 9, which is what, like a couple days later... They follow Garrow's nephew to a wooded area nearby where Garrow was hiding. Yeah, ah, they're tapping They're you. so they're dumb. Literally, what? Like, he, of course. You want to get caught? Like, first of all, why are you helping him? Thank you. Well, Second, like, they allegedly believe him, but I don't know. Allegedly? I don't understand why you're saying allegedly. Obvious, like. Well, because they're saying that they believed him that he was being framed at the time. But I don't think that they really did. I think they're just trying to help him. But that's her story is that she believed he was being framed. And that's why they're helping him. I don't know. Either way, not the way to handle it, probably. So they find Garrow and he tries to run. Naturally. And in this process, he is shot in the foot, the arm, and the back. They find him lying on the ground, and nearby is a knife, a rope, and a flashlight that he had tried to hide. And he was actually playing dead when they found him. (laughs) He's not dead, though. And he is taken into custody. Major Donald 
Ambler spoke to the press and he said, it's too bad Garrow couldn't be taken without injury. This was a game Garrow chose and this is how we played it. He continued to say that he did hope that Garrow survived because there are things that they need to know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a lot. Yeah. There's a lot of unanswered questions here, and they don't even know the extent of his crimes yet at this point. No, no way they know the extent of his crimes. At the hospital, he is admitted to room 515 on the fifth floor, which was previously a psych ward, and he would remain there for 41 days. I mean, he was shot multiple times, though. At the end of this 41 days, he would be in a wheelchair, and this was due to his gunshot wounds. Good. And he is brought into custody for the murder of Phil, the camper. Okay. Right? That is what he is officially being arrested for right now. That is the only thing that they know okay, he did. Okay, can we now rehash his old crimes so we can get this motherfucker put away, please? <laughs> for, like, permanently? Yeah. Now, even though he shouldn't have been out, he shouldn't have been released the first time. Thank you. Believe it or not, this is where shit starts to get crazy. What do you mean? <laughs> oh my God. So on May 8, 1974, jury selection begins. Now, the courtroom only sits 40 spectators, but additional chairs and even borrowed metal detectors were brought in because they don't have metal detectors here. 2,700 potential jurors were screened, and that's half of the county's population. So basically half of the county is screened in an attempt to find a jury. The jury would consist of five men and seven women, and they actually had four alternates, which usually there's only two, but the judge thought that four would be necessary because this trial might get crazy. I am actually very surprised by the seven women, five men. I like it. Yeah, that's kind of surprising, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I feel like you would want to put him away. You would want women on the stand. Well, I mean, he still killed men too, but... Did do a lot of raping of women. But they don't know that. Oh, yeah, they don't even know that. Oh, my God, this is just for Phil's murder. This is just for Phil's murder. This is why I said it gets crazy. Months before, now months before the trial begins, Garrow admits to his lawyers that he killed Alicia Hawk and Susan Petz, along with Daniel Porter. Because right now, they don't know he's responsible for those. No, did they ever find... Oh, yeah, they did find Susan's body. Now, no. Susan's body has not been found. The the girl that he... No, wait, who's the... They've only found Daniel, who was tied to the tree. Alicia Hawk is in the cemetery, hidden in the cemetery. She's the girl that went missing from school, right? Right, the 16-year-old. And Susan Petz is in the mine shaft. Yeah. But nobody has found either of these women yet. Okay, so both the women are still missing. But Garrow tells his attorneys that he is responsible... For killing them. Okay. Now they actually follow a hand drawn map. His lawyers? Yes. Not the police? No, they haven't notified the police. Oh my God. (laughs) So they want to go and see if these women are really there because they think he might be lying. They actually have a police tail on them, which they lose before heading out to the mine shaft in the Andorondack Forest. And this is not far from where Garrow's parents live, where he says that Susan Petz is, right? They find the shaft, and Armani, one of his attorneys, climbs into the hole and immediately panics and has to be pulled back out. But he had seen a leg and a blue sneaker. He crawls back in with a flashlight and a camera, and he snaps a picture of what would be Susan Petz's body. The next morning, they head into the Oakwood Cemetery, where Garrow claimed that he had left Alicia Hawk, and the lawyers are unable to find her. When they go back and tell Garrow this, he swears that she is there, and he gives them more details. They return and follow instructions, and they do actually find her, and they snap another photo. So, of course, after this, they go straight to the police. I'm totally kidding. They don't do that. And this is actually something that 
is still debated to this day. Debated in what? About whether or not this was the right thing to do. No. The legal thing to do. What is, what, what do you mean? What, what? So. I'm sorry. Okay. What? Calm down. Client attorney privilege. If they go to police with the information that their client has given them, they can be disbarred for life. It's the fact that they went to the crime scenes and saw the bodies. It's not just the confession. They went and Based saw... Based on his confession, though. And we're going to... Calm down, Madison. We are going to talk about this a little bit later. The legal system is a load of shit. Okay. That is... No. Okay, so... I will tell you right now, there is a lot that comes out of this, just this situation. And that's what makes this case so well known is because it is actually studied in law school even to this day. But we are going to talk about that a little later. In the meantime, while his lawyers now know that there are two dead bodies that their client is responsible for, that there are two families who are still missing their children, they try to focus on this trial. And I will tell you right now that this secret destroys their lives, both of them. But we're going to go back to the trial right now. Okay, during Garrow's trial, for the murder of Phil, because that's all we're talking about right now. Because they don't even know. They don't even know. This trial starts in 1974, and Garrow would plead insanity. Interesting. Which, a lot of this goes back to his childhood. There's a lot of testimony about his childhood. Like, it is suggested that he was made a murderer, not born a murderer, based on his childhood. The prosecution would call 32 witnesses, and they would argue their case for five days. The defense would actually call Garrow himself to the stand, and on the stand, he would relay his childhood and also admit to three murders and eight rapes. Garrow actually testifies that he told his defense attorney, Francis Belge and Frank Armani, that he had murdered Alicia Hawk and Daniel Porter and Susan Petz. So... Of course, now the attorneys have to admit that they went to see if he was lying and actually found the bodies. Yeah, so what was, like, the reaction of the court? What, what? Uh, what, I outrage, can't... shock. There's a lot of reactions that happen from this. But in, and I don't know, I, I doubt that Garrow was instructed to do that. I think that it just came out. Oh, my God, I bet you his lawyer was like, what the fuck was that? Well, I also think they might have been relieved because they had actually, oh. like— considered trying to anonymously report where these bodies were so that they wouldn't get in trouble and they wouldn't get disbarred. Mm -hmm. But they couldn't find a way to do it. Like, they were very stressed out about this. Oh, yeah, they were probably relieved, but they probably didn't talk about doing that beforehand. So the lawyer, I assume. I feel like Garrow, someone just pull a wild card, like a, like... Yeah, so either he pulled a wild card or it was all part of the, like defense's, like, argument that he was mentally ill. I'm not sure which one. Either way, I would say that if that was their strategy, I feel like they set him up. (laughs) Either way, lawyers are probably relieved. Yeah. Now, they did actually, at one point, try to use the information about where these two women were to strike a plea deal. But they are unsuccessful in doing this. I also doubt the lawyers are trying that hard. Well, they want to give that information up, though. They want to tell police where the bodies are. Oh, they still can't tell them where the bodies are? Right. Attorney-client privilege prevents them from revealing that information at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Susan's body would be found four months after this by two 12-year-old boys who are playing near the mine on Thanksgiving Day. They would run home and tell their mother, who thought they were making it up, and that it was probably a mannequin, and actually took nine days of them annoying her before she agreed to go and check it out. 
It's never a mannequin. It's never. It's never a, who, no. When have you ever seen a mannequin in the woods? The answer is never, never. because it's a fucking body. Although I'm sure people have seen mannequins in the woods. I'm actually going to go dump a bunch of mannequins in the woods just to fuck with people. Dude, if I could buy a mannequin, I totally would just to like leave it in weird places. Oh, mom. I, I bet you there's somewhere where some warehouse is getting rid of mannequins. Yeah. Now, on December 8th, Alicia's body would be found by a college student at the cemetery. So both women are found, and they are found without the testimony of these lawyers or without the cooperation of Garrow. Gotcha. Which at least gives me a little bit of solace, but at the same time, months have gone by where somebody has known where they are. Ugh. Can you imagine being their family? The public is actually outraged by this, by the information. Of course they are. Yeah. I think we can all agree that it is outrageously disappointing that this information could not be released to police or was not released to police. Yeah. In 1975, Garrow was convicted and sentenced to a 25-year-to-life sentence at Clinton Correctional Facility. While in prison, he sued everyone for everything. The state police, his lawyers, the hospital. (laughs) Yeah, so this man, after everything he put his lawyers through, actually tries to sue them. Yeah. In 1977, after having his request to be transferred to a facility for the elderly and the handicapped, because remember, he's in a wheelchair. He sued the state for $10 million because they wouldn't transfer him. And he claims he's not getting adequate care. In 1978, he was transferred to Fishkill Facility for handicapped inmates in exchange for dropping all of the lawsuits that he had against the state. Um, Why they would transfer him, I don't know. I would have said no. I would have made him go through with his lawsuits and good luck to you. He convinced another inmate to get his wife to smuggle in a gun for him and threatened to hurt their children if he did not comply. Because they're in like a minimum facility right now. Mm -hmm. He is in a minimum security facility that is only for elderly and handicapped inmates. Okay? She actually cooks a chicken and hides a gun inside the chicken. And she plans to smuggle it in during a visit where she would enter through the outdoor picnic area where there was no metal detector. Because it's minimum security. I can't even fucking handle this. And she actually brought her husband food every week. So she didn't think that this would raise any red flags with the guards. Seriously. On her way to the prison, her and her children got hungry and they ate the chicken. (laughs) Which made it impossible for her to deliver the gun that way. And I think it's very probable that she was really looking for a way out of actually doing this. Either way, Garrow is furious and they come up with a new plan. She would buy a bucket of chicken from KFC and she would put the gun inside. She would then drop it off at Garrow's son's hotel room and he would smuggle it in to his dad. And he is 18 at the time, by the way. So this is a really dick thing to do because that's going to get him into trouble. So when he takes the chicken in, he actually pours coleslaw and gravy over the top of it in hopes that the security guards won't dig around in the chicken, which actually works. And he actually hands the bucket of chicken to a guard, and then he goes through the metal detector, and then the guard hands him back the chicken on the other side. Like, sorry, why do you, why again do you need to, uh, why can't the bucket of chicken go through the metal detector with you? Exactly. I I mean, I don't know. Exactly. That night... Garrow makes his bed like he's in it, and he uses a table leg to pry open the bars on his cell because we are in a minimum security facility, and that can be done. (sighs) I just read the next part. So, um, guess what he did after prying the bars open? He uh, climbed over the fence, and you may ask yourself, what? Isn't he in a wheelchair? Yeah, turns out he was faking his paralysis the entire time. And it sounds like when they go back and interview everybody involved in this case, everybody seemed to know he was faking it because there had been multiple incidents where he had given himself away. But, like, nobody does anything about it. 
So a three-day manhunt ensues. And when they found Garrow, he opens fire, shooting at the officers. They return fire, and Garrow is shot and killed. They also found a sharpened butter knife on him from the prison. <laughs> which... Why that means it's knives? like a metal butter knife, probably. Yeah. And he was able to sharpen this butter knife. And funny story, I read in the Sworn to Silence book, which is about Robert Garrow, that they had actually concluded that he had left the area and were calling it quits for the day when a news crew showed up and wanted to document the search. So they sent a group of searchers across this field so that they could film it to like film the search. And that's when one of the searchers actually found a radio on the ground that belonged to Garrow. So they decided that they needed to search the area again and they actually find him. So they were leaving for the night. He was almost in the clear. Yeah. But then somebody needed like some footage for like to document the search for him. Oh my gosh. I want to talk about the map for a second. Remember the map that they find in the car? Uh Uh-huh. There are a lot of markings on this map. Police go back and they try to see if they can line up any of these notations on this map with actual unsolved crimes. And they are able to do that in some cases. And in some cases, they're able to line up these marks with crimes that have been solved. In 1957, so years ago, long time ago, Garrow was questioned when a young pregnant woman named Ruth Whitman was found beaten and murdered in a ditch. Two off-duty police officers had seen the woman at a diner with a man who looked a lot like Garrow. So they had brought him in for an interview. Now, this case is unsolved. He was never arrested or convicted of this. He was just seen with this woman. And that's it. We have no idea if he was responsible for this or not. Sounds kind of like him. Now, one marking is from Hamilton, Ontario. And this is where 26-year-old Adele Komorowski left a campus building at 11.10 p.m. And she was carrying an umbrella. She was headed to her dorm room at Brandon Hall. A woman in a conference room a few floors above where Adele had left heard screaming. She heard a woman's voice screaming, leave me alone. She ran to the window and saw a man speaking to Adele. And then she saw him dragging her by the wrists into the woods. And she was screaming, please let me go. Don't hurt me. The woman yelled through the window to leave her alone. And she called campus security. But by the time they got to her, she was dead. The man had tied her up in a sadistic pose, the rope was tied around both of her wrists and her neck with her hands above her head. So if she struggled, the rope would tighten around her neck. And they actually didn't realize that she had the rope around her neck initially because she had struggled so fiercely that it was like embedded in her skin. She also had a mechanics rag stuffed into her mouth. And weirdly enough, they found a bra nearby that did not belong to her, which is also really weird and Mm. random. Either way, the case goes cold. And this occurred on a Tuesday evening around midnight. Now, remember I said that the days were kind of important. So his days off were Wednesdays and Saturdays. But his wife said that he would often be out late the night before when he had the day off. This would have made... Tuesdays and Fridays. The night that he would be out Hunting late. days for him. Yeah. He got off work around 3 p.m. on Tuesday, and he could have reached Hamilton by 11 p.m. So by the time this woman was mm-hmm. attacked. Also unsolved. Okay, could be him. I could see it. So Utica, east of Syracuse, on January 12th, 1972, Joanne Pichon had been murdered on her way home from school. She was dropped off by the bus and cut through a wooded area. Oh, she was just doing a shortcut. Around 3 p.m., a man grabbed her and dragged her into the woods. 
where he ties her hands over her head to a tree using her own shoelaces, which we know for a fact that Garrow did do that. He did do that in the past, yeah. And a piece of clothing was stuffed into her mouth and secured with her purse strap that was placed over her head. A 12-year-old boy witnessed a man walking down a trail near where Joanne's body was found, and he recalled that the man had one ear that stuck out further than the others. Which Garrow did. Interesting. And when the man ran, his hair flopped up and down, and police believe that he may have been wearing a wig, which we also know Garrow is known to do. A brown, gold, or copper-colored car was seen speeding away, and on January 12th, the same day that Joanne was murdered, Garrow traded in a tan Volkswagen. So that's a really big coincidence. Yeah, it is. Also, it was a Wednesday afternoon when Joanne was kidnapped and murdered. One of his days off. This case is technically closed when police announced in 2011 that John Hawkins was the likely killer, but he had killed himself in prison on unrelated charges. So they closed this case saying, this guy who's in prison is probably responsible. So we don't need to worry about it. Yeah. (sighs) On September 2nd of 1972, 17-year-old Melody Rowe left her mother's apartment around dinner time to mail some bills, but she never returned home. Her mother did not report her missing for several days, and her case got almost no media attention. This disappearance was on a Saturday. In 1997, human remains were found in a small group of trees near Tully Farms near Route 11A, And in 2005, the remains would be exhumed and DNA would match them to Melody Rowe. So they do have her body. Hmm. But the case is still unsolved. I mean, he's in the age, she's in the age range because he's killed just lots of young people. And he also raped those little girls too. So like. He's not that picky. Yeah. On Wednesday, Wednesday, July 25, 1973 which is two weeks after Alicia Hawk disappears, a 21-year-old named Martha Allen, who lived between Utica and Syracuse, was reported missing by her grandfather, who had recently moved in with her. She was last seen around 7, 10 p.m. Police realized that she had probably had a set of keys on her since they were missing from her house, and they asked the public to be on the lookout for them. A man came forward saying that he had found a set of keys in a cemetery in Canastota, about six miles west of where she lived. And he placed them in a nearby mailbox, hoping that the mailman could find who they belonged to, assuming that they belonged to somebody on his route. That's actually really smart. They did end up being Martha's keys. Her body would later be found in Black Creek. And this is one that Garrow would confess to his lawyers that he was responsible for. So, I mean, if we look at, there are so many cases that he could be responsible for, but there's also a lot that he could not be responsible for, too. Mm Mm-hmm. Those were the ones that kind of coincided with markings on his map. Okay. Okay. There are also many unsolved rapes in the area around where Garrow lived. Oh, and Garrow was threat like threatened people left and right. So who knows how many? Well, people and we know threats- that he started off by raping. He got himself arrested. Yeah. So then he went on to killing, killing. I think. Now some of these were in the woods. One was in a cemetery. So very similar mo's to what Garrow had done in the past. Yeah. Oh yeah. Now according to. Kind of a fun fact. According to Criminal Minds fandom, Thomas Yates from season 11 Tommy was, Yates. Yep, was based off of Robert Garrow. And he also made an appearance in season 12. Garrow was buried in Oakwood Cemetery where he had hidden Alicia Hawk's body. And I really don't like that. Why the? F- and only four people attended. Ew, who's even attending? I don't know. Psalms 51 was read about asking for God's absolution. 
That was a lot of information. That was a lot. I do highly recommend the book Sworn to Silence by Jim Tracy. It's on Robert Garrow, and he does an excellent job. I read the entire book. It's pretty good. I got it on Amazon. Super easy to find. Oh, I was going to go back to the whole um, lawyer thing. So initially, they did <laughs> they did try to like prosecute them for withholding this information. Yeah, but what were they supposed to do? They were going to get prosecuted either way because if they did... Right, well, and it, they did not get convicted for this. They They did not... Like, they were able to legally hold up their end of the argument. Have very mixed emotions about them. As do I, and as do a lot of people, I would think. Now, this case is still talked about in law schools because... What do you do? It No, yeah, because this is an example of what you could face with your client-lawyer Confidential. confidentiality. Yeah. So... They have actually, these lawyers have actually, in later times, like closer to now, been praised for the way that they handled this. But initially, they were crucified. And their lives were basically ruined. What did they, what did the court, like when they were, what what did they say that they were supposed to do? Like what did, what was deemed the correct, like did they, were they deemed to do the correct thing? Yeah, at the end of the day, they were exonerated. Okay. But they did have file like they did have charges filed against them for withholding this information from police. I think them seeing the bodies is a little bit too far for me though. But like they I, wouldn't have, but they wouldn't have found the bodies without their client's confession. I know. I know. I They tried. even tried to go they even tried to go after one of the lawyers for he I can't remember which victim it was, but he had actually picked up her head that had been moved away from her body by animals. And he placed it back with her body. And they actually tried to go after him for tampering with evidence after the fact for that. And he said, look, I just couldn't leave her like that. I felt like I needed to put her head back where it belonged. So it's such a hard situation. Yeah. But their families were furious. And I understand that. And I understand their dilemma as well. It's such a hard thing to have to live with. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, 100% because... Uh, but yeah, let us know what you guys think of this case. We really appreciate everybody listening. We do have some new Patreons. Okay, so that is... A wrap on episode two. Part two of Robert Garrow. So we have a few new Patreons. We have Isabel Crother. Hi, Isabel. Welcome to Patreon. Catherine Ra- Catherine Rather? 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 I think, yeah, Rather. Hi, Catherine. Welcome to Patreon. And we also have April Lucky. Hi, April. Welcome to Patreon. Cool name. All right. Thank you so much for tuning in. Sorry again for the two-parter. We really appreciate you guys. Don't forget to go and join our Patreon if you want to be entered into the drawing. All right. Thanks. And we'll talk to you soon. Yep. Bye. Bye.